motion carried. Well, sisters and brothers, it's a, it's a great convention. It, our, it's the last convention we increased in numbers, and, in, and then we increased over that again this year. We have a, a guest with us this morning, uh, sisters and brothers. When you, when you hear his background, uh, he, you will find that you can relate with, with Ken on so many levels. Ken, first of all, is the, the first local union leader uh, to be elected CL, CAW national uh, president, and he was uh, uh, he was uh, elected at the or was re-elected again in the uh, in in August or excuse me at the convention held in August 2009. Ken's a rank and file leader and activist uh, who who has emphasized within the labor movement and the bro uh, broader community during <coughs> excuse me outreach in. I don't know. I don't know if it was the glasses or last night. <laughs> last, night. <laughs> last night, yeah, I, I hung around with this guy too much. <laughs> uh, uh, outreach in the, within the broader labor movement and, and community uh, during his term as president of Local 444 of, of uh, CAW. He, Ken was born in Windsor uh, and has been a member of the CAW Local 444 since he began working at Chrysler in 72 at the age of 18. In 1978, Ken was elected shop steward of the chassis division, and where his strong desire to improve quality of life of workers emerged. Ken held the positions of committee per, uh, person, chairperson, and vice president before taking over the role of uh, president of Local 444. Ken, in, in 1994, Ken was the chair of the CAW Master Bargaining Committee for the last five rounds of Big Three Bargaining. He also uh, was also a CAW National Board member and, and the president of CEW Council for, past, for the past 10 years. He was a, an active delegate uh, to the Windsor and District Labor Council and a community lead, leader in Windsor, Essex. Ken was involved in many community organizations, uh, including the Motor City Credit Union, Guardian Board of Windsor, the Labor Sponsored Community Development Group, Hotel Du Hospital Board, the AIDS Committee of Windsor, and United Way of Windsor, uh, uh, Windsor Essex County. In 2002, as a tribute to his hard work and dedication, Ken was awarded the Charles E. Brooks Labor Community Award, a joint initiative uh, of the United Way and, and the Windsor and District Labor Council. Uh, he's been involved in a lot of things that we've been talking about at the last couple of days of this convention. I ask you to give a nice Nova Scotia welcome to Brother Ken Luenza. God damn, I hate those introductories. We're getting rid of them. Ken Lorenz, the president of the CAW. Again, thank you very much. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Thank you, Rick Clark. Thank you, the executive. First of all, let me say I'm thrilled, obviously, to be at the Federation Convention here in Nova Scotia. And I want to start by thanking each and every one of you for the work that you do every day to keep our movement alive, to keep it vibrant, to keep us active, to keep us relevant in the lives of the members that we are so privileged to represent, representing so many sectors of the economy, both private and public sector. Again, as Rick has already said, I was a steward for many, many years, a committee person, a, a chairperson, a local union president, and then obviously a long-term um, national executive board member of the CAW. So my history, quite frankly, allows me to be comfortable with workplace leadership, with rank and file activists, with those that do the work on the ground, because quite frankly, that's the history of the labor movement. And obviously, if you forget your roots and if you forget your activism, then the labor movement moving forward is going to be incredibly challenged. So I want to thank each and every one of you for the work that you do. I say this to our CAW leadership on an ongoing basis. I ask you as a simple question in this room here today. How many times has your members come up to you in the last couple years or since your existence and said, hey, thank you for doing such a wonderful job for us. Oh, by the way, thank you for taking on that fight last night and being at that demonstration and participating outside of the traditional work of the union through collective bargaining. And you know, that's what these conventions are all about. This conventions and conferences and 
and uh, national conventions. It's about bringing the labor movement together. It's about sharing each other's ideas. It's about the camaraderie, the friendship, the bonds of solidarity that we have for one another, which is incredibly important. Because in this movement today, contrary to what people may believe, we are under incredible attack. And when you're under incredible attack, you've got to mobilize even more than you've mobilized in the past. You have to build that bond of friendship, that bond of respect, that bond of fighting for one another in the interest of our members. Without that kind of enthusiasm, quite frankly, the labor movement is dead. So I want to thank all of you for your work. I want to begin by making a couple comments to, to everybody in the room. First of all, I've been in Nova Scotia uh, less how many times in the last couple months. And is this province exciting today? And let me begin by thanking Local 1 of the Marine Division again, Carl and his leadership, Lyle and his leadership, the executive that are here today. I want to, and I want to acknowledge the delegates yesterday for recognizing the Marine Division and Local 1 for their incredible contribution that they have made to the economic development of this province and shipbuilding more generally across Canada. And I know it's been raised over and over and over, but it's worth repeating based on the discussions and the debates that are going on in the community from politicians like Peter McKay. Let me say on the onset, I found it incredible that if you get off the plane in Nova Scotia, the first thing you see is ship starts here. And you see a major campaign. And then you go into the Tim Horton stores and you go into the business communities. And any other place in this community you see ship start here. And the facts of the matter is, ships didn't start here initially. The reality is, 15 years ago, the Marine Division, the Marine Division of this province, the Marine Union of this province put on a major campaign. And they said, shipbuilding matters to the Canadian economy. And as Carl said yesterday, people were saying, you know, it's an old economy, it's, it's that blue collar crap that's non-existent today. It's manufacturing, industrial jobs, jobs of the past. But that did not deter the union from saying that's an important sector of the economy. So what did the union do? The union put on a major campaign 15 years ago. And the major campaign called for a Canadian shipbuilding procurement policy for Canada in the interest of Canada. Pretty simple. Pretty simple. If our Navy, our Army, our rescue uh, teams need ships, then they ought to be manufactured, built right here in Canada. And obviously the goals were in the shipyards in Nova Scotia. So when I hear, when I hear, when I hear Peter McKay say, holy Christ, what a waste of money from the, from the municipality, from the provinces, from the unions. That wasn't necessary. Do you know what that's saying to Canadians from one end of the coast to the other? They prefer you to be unknowledgeable. They prefer you not to be active. They prefer us to be in isolation of the decisions that are made in Ottawa. I personally thought it was exciting that no matter where you go, you get off the plane, people are talking about the importance of shipbuilding. You go into a Tim Horton shop, people are talking about the importance of shipbuilding. So what Mr. McKay doesn't understand is that campaign energized all Nova Scotians and energized energize workers throughout the country that we can have a procurement policy that's in the interest of Canadian workers, in the interest of Canadian taxpayers, in the interest of Canadian services like health care, education, infrastructure improvements, everything that our taxes pay for, we need good manufacturing industrial jobs like shipbuilding to accommodate those particular jobs. So, so I say to Peter McKay today, you are offbeat brother. In fact, at the end of the day, it was the campaign. It was the campaign that convinced the federal government that a shipbuilding procurement is important. So we must remember that in every key sector of the economy, the Canadian government can use our tax dollars in the interest of the Canadian economy, just like they do in every other country in the world. There's been a lot of rhetoric in the United States about Buy American, and what does that mean to Canada? In the United States, on procurement policies, they've been buying American for over 50 years. The only difference today, when they're in a deep recession and they're challenged for jobs, obviously it's in the forefront. But every single tax dollar in the United States is spent in the United States in the interest of Americans. And the same thing applies across the board. So it's important for us to understand that. And I want to give you a story because I'm not sure that the community totally understands it, and I'm absolutely sure McKay doesn't. I stayed at a hotel, Mackenzie Hotel, 
in Shelbourne the other night. So I got up early. Actually, I don't sleep often anymore, and I don't think most of us do in this room if you think genuinely about our members. So I get up early in the morning, and I talk to the owner of the hotel. And I spent about an hour with him, having a coffee with him, and really a decent guy like all Nova Scotians. And we got talking about the economy. And he said to me, Ken, you would not believe how much business I lost when we lost that ferry and what it means today. At one time, you could go through this hotel in Shelbourne and all the hotel and see U.S. license plates. When that ship landed, the facts of the matter is Americans came here, they stayed here, and over the last year or so, we've had this struggle. But as a result of the shipbuilding industry, as a result of the enthusiasm, my hotel is now being booked by engineers, my hotel is being booked by executive officers, because down the street, the Shelbourne yard that was closed, quite frankly, reopened. And he said, that's going to generate economic development. That's going to allow all of the hotels on the Strip, all of the businesses in this small community to cherish. That's what this means to us in our community. So it is incredibly important that people understand that. On top of that, I did multiple interviews yesterday while I was in town. And they said to me, what does it mean? And you know, very selfishly, I said to, you know, about Carl and Lyle and the executive officers on the team. You know, selfishly, you could say, well, we enhanced the job security of our members for the long haul. We protected the interests of our members, their wages, their benefits, their conditions, their right to have a decent job. But more importantly for me as a national president, what we also established a generation of workers to come be ahead of us. There's people today that are gonna, we're going to require in the, in, in the shipbuilding industry, young people coming through universities, coming through colleges, coming through technical programs that are going to work in the shipbuilding industry. So the most significant victory for us is creating jobs for that next generation. Because at the end of the day, it's that generation that's out protesting today in every country in the world, in every community in the world, protesting the fact that they have less opportunities than we had, less opportunities than our generation had, less opportunities in terms of raising expectations versus constant despair. Those folks that are out in those occupies, they're talking about the lack of opportunity they've been given. They're talking about the social injustices. They're talking about the inequalities. They're talking about their lack of ability to even think about having a good job. And we participated and made a difference in their lives. And to me, that's important for the labor movement moving forward. So I want to raise that particular issue. I also want to raise the importance of the private and public sector. Let's make no bones about this, brothers and sisters. You know this. We are under attack. And we can talk about it till the cows come home, but we've got to strategize on how we defend each other's interests. But most importantly, we've got to recognize that when a public sector worker is under attack, so are the public services that they provide. At the end of the day, quite frankly, we have a slogan in our union because we are privileged today to represent public sector workers in education, in health care. In fact, I would say without any contradiction at all that our union has grown, our union has grown in strength, our union has grown in confidence as a result of tens of thousands of health care workers joining our union. And the reason for that is we believe in the importance of public services. We believe in the importance of public sector jobs. In fact, in this last set of recessions, if we did not have the public sector jobs and the stimulus that was put into some of the public services in this country, we would be in a deep recession. So we are in a great debt of gratitude to public services. As healthcare workers in here today, I want to thank you for the services that you provide our members and citizens more generally. I want to thank the, you for the work and the commitment and dedication that you have. Let me give you just a quick story, because this is how you learn and you grow in the labor movement. In Essex County, in Windsor, Ontario, we had a retirement home, and the boss wasn't paying our members, CAW members, for seven, eight weeks at a time. And then, let me tell you how asinine the, the world is in Ontario, and it probably is in Nova Scotia too, relative to the protection of workers. Here's workers go to work every day of the week in a rest home. And you, you folks can appreciate, rest homes aren't the typical rest homes. Rest homes today, there's lots of folks that are in rest homes today that actually should be in long-term care facilities. But they're in rest homes because of the shortage of long-term care in the country and in each respective province. In fact, we've got people sitting in hospitals today at an incredible cost because there's no room for them in long-term care facilities. So what, what happens? 
The workers, organized, don't get paid for seven or eight weeks. So what do we have to do as a union? The, under the law, the first thing you have to do is lodge a grievance, that the company violated the collective agreement for not paying the workers. Then you have to pursue it to arbitration. And we do all of that channels. It takes seven, eight weeks. Even when you expedite it, it takes seven or eight weeks. Well, the arbitrator, of course, rules. Boy, that's a pretty easy victory. Hey, went to arbitrator, give our case. The arbitrator says the employer has to pay. Well, thank you very much. Here's your 1500 bucks, and you move on. But at the end of the day, the employer doesn't pay. Then you have to take it to court to order a payment. And so we got so pissed off in the CAW that I went to this rest home and I said to the workers, the only way we're going to get the boss's attention is we have to refuse to work. As painful as it is, we have to withdraw your labor. If you're not getting paid, then why would you continue to work? All of them to a T looked at me and said, Mr. Lorenzo, I'm not in this business just for pay. I'm here to protect the interest of those that we service. There's lots of people here, if we walked off our job today, could potentially die because we have to medicate them. We have to be there for them. There's lots of people in this rest home here today that may die if they don't have the company that I provide them because they have no family. We ain't going nowhere. Now, as a union, get out there and do what the hell you have to do. So what did the CAW do? I put out a call letter to all CAW locals in the country. All CAW locals in the country made a contribution to the workers. As a result of that combined effort, we were able to pay the workers their entire pay until we settled it in the courts. Now, how did we settle this in the courts? The, obviously, the employer walked away from this workforce. We managed to get a new buyer to come in, refacilitate the building, refacilitate the services that were provided, and workers are getting paid. And I give that story because that's a heroism of healthcare workers. That's the kind of heart and commitment that we have in this province in this country and it was a lesson for me because you know I got my old industrial hat on the first thing I want to do is whack them the first thing I want to do is withdraw our labor the first thing I want to do is show the anger and at the end of the day quite frankly I think the strategy of our members continuing to work allowed us to win justice for those particular members so I it's important that we all totally understand that I also want to talk about the need for us to think about organizing more seriously now, we do have a good relationship, and we must build on that relationship between private and public sector. But the facts of the matter is union density is significantly dropping. In comparison to other countries, we're doing reasonably well. But we shouldn't compare ourselves to reasonable uh, other countries. In the 70s, for example, the private sector was organized 35%. 35%. Today, we're organized less than 17%. The public sector continues to be organized at about 70%. So thank God for the public sector and public sector unions, because if it wasn't for public sector unions, union density would be significantly lower, in fact, comparable to the United States, if it wasn't for public sector unions. So what we need to do is understand what we need to do, what we need to do is understand that a union job is a union job, whether it's in the public sector or whether it's in the private sector. What we need to understand is that we can't have a strong public sector without a strong private sector. We can't have a strong private sector without a strong public sector. We are connected as trade unionists from one end of the country to the other, whether you're public or private sector, and we're connected. We're connected on the services that are provided by the public sector. So what irritates me, infuriates me, when Stockwell Day stands up in the federal house and says, no longer can public sector workers have the gold-plated pension plans because of the rest of the country doesn't have it. In fact, they stand out in isolation against the rest of the country. Those days are over. He didn't stand up and say gold-plated pension plans paid 50% by the employees that contribute to the pension plan. He doesn't stand up and say, as trade unionists, when we bargain pension plans for our members, it's part of the total compensation. We could have said 50 years ago, we don't need pensions. We could have put more cash in our pockets. We could have said, as individuals, we'll bargain a higher wage. But we decided that pensions were very, very important for our members, very important for the future, not just for ourselves, because I correlate good pension plans for future jobs. At the end of the day, the biggest job creation we could have in Canada is good pension plans. If you have good pension plans, people will retire with respect and with dignity. 
If you don't have good pension plans, they won't retire. So I ask you folks in this room today, both public and private sector, when the company's saying we're going to reduce or the employer we're going to reduce through attrition, the facts of the matter is, ask yourself, ask yourself how many people would retire if in fact they didn't have a pension plan. How many opportunities have we generated as a result of our collective bargaining for future generations? I could tell you in the auto industry, which has been devastated by job loss as a result of free trade. For example, in the auto industry today, as a result of the crisis at General Motors, Fords and Chrysler, as a result of significant market share loss, as a significant loss in, of decline of jobs in a market, you know, it pisses me off, and I've got to be candid with you. Hyundai, for example, doesn't have one single manufacturing job in Canada. Not one single manufacturing job in Canada, yet they are one of the highest producing manufacturers in Canada today as a result of the cars that come in from Korea into our country. And that's a question of trade. But at the end of the day, when you take a look at the imbalance of trade, we have to deal with these particular issues. We've talked about it more and more. We're not against trade. The facts of the matter is we want trade. Canada needs trade, but it has to be reciprocal trade. It can't be one way. Korea can't send us 250,000 vehicles, and we send them 250. That's not balanced trade, and that's not in the interest of Canada. So when we're talking about trade, we have to talk about value dollar. Korea sends us a dollar this way, we send them a dollar that way. Every single country has to do that. And we should all be offended about the trade agreements. Imagine this. And you're all bargainers, for God's sake. You know, think about being in government. And now you're forming a free trade agreement with the European unions. Is there a day that's gone by in the last six or seven months where the European Union crisis hasn't been on national television? Has there been a day where we haven't seen protests in Germany, in Greece, and all of the European countries? Today in the newspaper, the, the euro is under significant attack, whether that was the right decision by government or not the right decision by government. So in the next couple of weeks, Harper's going to announce a trade deal with the European unions. Now, the European unions, quite frankly, aren't going to be buying anything off of us because they don't have any money right now. So what they want to, for their economy to survive is sign a free trade agreement for they could obviously build and send to Canada. They're not ordering nothing from buses to, to trains to any infrastructure. They're goddamn broke. So we're going to sign a trade agreement with countries that need to export their products into Canada at the backs of the Canadian economy and Canadian workers. This is unjustifiable. And these are the kinds of issues in the labor movement we have to fight for long term or we're going to have some significant challenges in terms of protecting private and public sector jobs moving forward. we got to take on the root causes of the job crisis in Canada, the root causes of the insecurity that our members feel, and obviously the root causes these kind of trading relationships. The other one that's most insulting, if we call the meeting in Columbia today, where they signed a tentative trade agreement with Colombia. If we were meeting in London today, or in, in Colombia today, there's a possibility that about 25% of you would be shot, executed, or thrown in jail for advocating trade union rights, trade union principles. And yet we sign a trading agreement with Colombia that kills trade union leaders, that locks them up, that throws them in jail forever as a result of advancing the cause of working men and women in Colombia. This should be against the law, brothers and sisters. When I was a young person, I can remember the federal government, regardless of what stripes they were, liberal, conservatives, new Democrats in opposition, that used to talk about human rights, used to talk about labor rights, used to connect, <laughs> used to connect the uh, atrocities of other countries in the connection with trade and made sure that there was rules in place to level the playing field. So brothers and sisters, my point is, we've got a lot of work to do in this room. We cannot allow divide and conquer. We can't allow the federal government without a voice to say gold-baited plated pension plans are gone. Because quite frankly, we've taken a hit in the private sector. There's no question about that. But it doesn't make any sense to me that says in the private sector, we've had to make some sacrifices 
painful sacrifices, but we intend to rebound. We intend to continue fighting. We intend to continue fighting for what's important to our members. It doesn't make any sense for me to say to the general public, hey, you know what, like, let's look at Tim Hortons because there's so many Tim Horton cups in the room here today. You know, the, they say, well, 70% of the people don't have a pension. So the argument is, why should you have one? We've got to change the argument. The argument's got to be, why doesn't Tim Horton workers have a pension? Their boss, their boss, their boss. Believe me, the owner of Tim Hortons and the executive officers of Tim Hortons have a defined benefit plan for themselves. But they don't want to share the wealth to our members. They don't want to share the wealth to unorganized workers. So it doesn't make sense that at the end of the day, if you can't have a pension, if you can't have a pension, therefore you shouldn't have one. We've got to change that mentality. We've got to be the voice that says all people are entitled to good, decent pension plans. And that's why under the Canadian Labour Congress and all of the affiliates, and obviously Rick played a role in that at the Canadian Labour Congress level. We put on a major campaign, a major campaign that said we've got to enhance Canada pension. We got to enhance old age security. We got to enhance the guaranteed income supplement. Now, you know, that just didn't pull out of the sky. Those social programs was introduced as a result of a progressive labor movement demanding those issues from political parties, regardless of who was in power. Political parties never give workers something just because they feel like giving it to us or because we put their sign on the lawn. You got to fight for them every single day. So we win those social programs. And we were this close to having a victory. We were this close to having all of the finance ministers throughout this country defend the interest of increasing the Canada Pension Plan, getting retirees out of poverty, obviously defending seniors moving forward. And then obviously Harper got elected to a majority government. And today Canada Pension, Old Age Security and Supplement Income isn't even on the political agenda in his eyes. But we've got to keep it on the political agenda with provincial premiers. Provincial premiers can make a difference. That's why, obviously, we've got to squeeze Daryl Dexter, that when he goes to those finance ministers and he sends his finance ministers to talk about issues important to the Canadian economy, they got to raise the enhancement of Canadian pension plans. They got to do it from Manitoba, another new democratic government. They got to do it from Ontario that made the commitment from a Liberal Party on the improvements of the Canada Pension Plan. We got to keep the feet under their fire at the end of the day and win justice for all seniors, for all retirees in the interest of the Canadian economy. So brothers and sisters, so, but, let's, but let's be fair. And this may create a little bit of controversy. It may create a little bit of controversy. We could have done a hell of a lot better. The facts of the matter is, in a labor movement today, we still have too many talkers and are not enough doers. In a labor movement today, we still, again, sometimes think our shit don't stink. The facts of the matter is, when we make a commitment to do work for our members, we have to do it together. We got to do it collectively. You know what I would like to do? And I'll just give you an example. And I would ask people if that ever, ever has any educationals to think about Port Elgin as a, as a place to have that training, that learning opportunity in a trade union environment. The Canadian Labor Congress has labor college courses at Port Elgin. Every single affiliate in this room has sent a delegate, if not three or four delegates, to take the labor college program, the four week, very intense, labor intense program. And guess what they did in Port Elgin? They took the titles off the representatives. When they put the names of the delegates, whether you're United Steelworkers, whether you're PSAC, whether you're QP, whether you're CAW, whether you're SEU, no matter what you do, they said, hey, you're Ken Luenza. Not Ken Luenza from CAW, you're Ken Luenza as a trade unionist. And they said to these students, you're going to learn in a learning environment collectively. You're going to learn what's important to trade unionists. You're going to learn what's important to the Canadian economy. And then when we went to the graduation, all of the heads of the unions, these kids all got up. I shouldn't say they're kids. Some of them are, are adults. But they all got up and said, what a learning experience this was. Because we didn't talk about CAW in isolation. We didn't talk about SEIU. We didn't talk about CUPE. We didn't talk about some of the division in the labor movement, what we talked about coming together. And that's what the labor movement has to do more today than we've ever done in the history of our movement. 
We have to be one trade unionist. Yes, we can be respectful of our affiliated unions. We could be respectful of our local unions. We could take great pride in our individual organizations, but we're bigger than our individual organizations. More importantly today, a worker is a worker is a worker, and they need the defense of the union from one end of the country to the other. So I challenge, I challenge you today, as the CAW leadership does to me more often than not. I get an opportunity to meet CAW leadership on a regular basis. I go from community to community. We have a CAW council meeting every three months where we bring a thousand delegates together to talk about the future of the union, the future challenges, the fight back campaign. And I'm incredibly proud of the work that the CAW does. But even I know that we can do more. If it wasn't for Les pushing me, if it wasn't for Carl pushing me, if it wasn't for CAW leadership, pushing me all the time, whether you want to agree or disagree, a leader can become complacent. A leader can be just a spokesperson versus being an activist. We must push each other to be better than we've ever done. Our members expect us to give them the full representation of every single union in the country, the best practices of every union. When we look at a collective agreement today, if we have a common workplace, we should be looking at the best collective agreement in the common workplaces and achieve the best collective agreement, not going to the worst collective agreement. Every one of us is sophisticated enough in healthcare to look at every collective agreement in long-term care homes as an example. And our model should be the best one. Our model should be improving the best one. Our model shouldn't be the missy middle that puts pressure on the high and uh, collective agreements. We've got to start thinking strategically. We've got to start thinking collectively. We've got to start doing the research on what's in the best interest of our members versus what's always in the best interest of affiliated unions. So brothers and sisters, I want to end by saying this to you, because a brother here, this young brother said to me, Ken, I don't know what your speech is about, but I just want to let you know that our members aren't really into that merging with the new Democrats and the liberals. We don't really like that idea. But let me tell you the facts, brothers and sisters. I don't raise this because I'm a lover with the liberals. I learned a long time ago, politics is challenging. <laughs> I learned a long time ago that when you elect a political party that you believe is your party, if you don't defend what's important to your members, then quite frankly, political parties won't respond. You're having a hell of a debate in this province today whether you should have first contract legislation and card check. Well, brothers and sisters, I could tell you from Ontario, Bob Ray made significant improvements in labor legislation when he was the premier of an NDP government. But he made a fatal mistake from our perspective. He called for public consultation for 14 months. For 14 months, the business community lined up. For 14 months, there was ads about the the NDP government being not favorable to employers, therefore not favorable to jobs. He created one hell of a division. And then as a result of that, his popularity never really did increase. I mean, the social contract causes a problem, of course, but his popularity because of the consultation process never increased. Now look at the other end of it. Mike Harris gets elected, takes over from a Bob Ray government. His first act of legislative change in the province of Ontario, wasn't asking for consultation. He wiped out all the labor relations reforms that Bob Ray put in on the first month in office with a majority government. Didn't ask for consultation, didn't ask for the opinion of the labor movement, and then ultimately the labor movement responded by days of actions, days of protests, demonstrating from one end of the province, ultimately we beat him. So my message to Daryl Dexter today is, Hey, you don't need consultation on card check. If you want to strengthen, if you want to, if you want to strengthen workers' rights, therefore strengthens the economy, because there's a connection between strengthening workers' rights and strengthening the economy. Study after study would suggest to you that good wages, decent benefits, builds communities, builds nations provides the taxes that's necessary for the public services that we have here today. You need unions to do that, quite frankly. And then first contract arbitration. It's absolutely insane. That should be actually a, a policy of the employer. You know, if you can't get a first collective agreement with an employer, what's wrong with first contract binding arbitration? To get that first collective agreement, to make sure that the employer doesn't intimidate our members 
during the process of trying to get a first collective agreement. But it's not those two issues in isolation. It's about government. The government of the New Democratic Party in, in this province inspiring other provinces that if your constituency represents it and gives you an opportunity to represent, then use that power the same way the Tories and Liberals use that power against us. Now when you talk federally, and this will be my last couple remarks, when you talk federally, I went out there a couple weeks ago, I don't know if you know, but Pat Martin from the Winnipeg West made a public comment that the New Democratic Party will never win power federally unless we organize a center-left party. And he talked about merging with the Liberal Party. I never talked about it. Quite frankly, we talked about it in our union many times on how we can win power, how we can win progress for our members, and the need for political parties to think outside the box. We've debated this in our union over and over and over. So we know, based on the success of Stephen Harper, and by the way, the MP in Nova Scotia played a key role. People forget Peter McKay's role in uniting the right, in uniting a conservative reform party. In fact, it was Peter McKay, the leader of the progressive conservative party that said, we ain't gonna win power ever if we're divided in the right with reform, progressive conservatives, conservatives. And Peter McKay made a very unpopular decision with progressive conservatives. Now, there's a difference now between progressive conservatives and the reformers of Stephen Harper. And, and, and I remember Peter McKay got a lot of shit for making that decision. But you know what he said? He said, we'll never gain power. We'll never be able to put on a corporate agenda politically unless we unite the right. So they unite the right. Now, Stephen Harper has a majority government, boy, and he's treating it like there's no opposition in the House. He's treating that majority government as if the NDP and the Liberals and the Bloc and the Green Party is irrelevant in the House because that's what you can do as a majority government. So we have some choices. We can continue to have the status quo, or we can continue to lose the social and health care benefits and those issues that are important to Canadians. Now, let me give you the example. In Denmark, for the last 10 years, and I just learned this through a delegation that came to the CAW from Denmark, union delegation. I expressed to them four or five weeks ago our frustrations, our anxieties of politics. And our anxieties are real, folks. In the province of Ontario, think about this, 49% of the voting public voted in the province of Ontario. That means 51% of the people don't have any faith in politics anymore. And quite frankly, that's scary for democracy when moving forward. So I said to the Danish, boy, I'm really pissed. You know, we put on a campaign to try to avoid a Harper majority government. And at the end of the day, they got their majority government because they united the right. And they are going to destroy everything that's important to us over this four years. Harper is not a Gene Cretchen. He's not going to be a 45-year 40, politician. He's here to make a statement, change Canada for good, and quite frankly, move on. Because that's his history. So you know what the, the Danish said to me? Ken, for 10 years, this is exactly what they said, we got nine left of center political parties. For 10 years, we took reductions in Canada pension, or not Canada pension, in their pension plans. They took deductions in employment insurance. They took uh, significant cuts in employment regulatory changes in Denmark. The right wing government that was governing Denmark took total power and took total control. What the nine left of center political parties did two months ago is they got into a room and they established a left of center party. And they, what they did was they built a coalition going into the government, which meant that some of them didn't run against each other. They put strategic decisions in place in particular writings. And guess what happened? The left of center got elected by 51% of the electorate, and now they run the majority government under a coalition government because they thought outside the box. They thought strategically. And at the end of the day, if they wouldn't have, the right wing would have won another four-year term and would have further damaged Denmark. So in Canada, we've got to think outside the box. So we've got a couple choices. Do we have the debate? And by the way, they're having it at the federal level of the New Democratic Party. They're having it at the federal level of the uh, Liberals. I can show you the facts. I can show you significant write-ups. They're having it as leadership. But when we have it on the ground, some way we're betraying a particular party. That's not true at all. 
The facts of the matter is what we're trying to do is win justice for our members. What we're trying to do is win progress for our members. And the question is, how do we best do that? Now, if that's not the answer, then all of us have to go on a major campaign in the next couple years. And we got to introduce proportionate representation to Canada. Because if we have proportionate representation in Canada, it means every vote counts. And it means Stephen Harper cannot have a majority parliament with 38% of the vote in Canada. So we've got some choices, and they're tough choices. We can either say, let the status quo go, and hope that God helps us get elected somewhere down the road, but the big guy ain't been helping us much lately. I don't offend any Catholics about out there, but the fact of the matter is the big guy hasn't helped us much in the last little while. So we can't rely on him. So what we got to do is rely on our activism. We have to rely on our ability to come together. And we got to rely on our ability to have a god darn debate without kicking the hell out of each other. Because you got two choices. You either form left of center politics in this country and defeat the Stephen Harper government, or you demand proportionate representation where every single vote works. Now that cannot be done without the labor movement. That kind of debate cannot happen without the labor movement. That kind of social consciousness that's important for all Canadians cannot happen without the labor movement. The labor movement is the official opposition in this country from the ground. We are, we are, we are, we are the folks that represent our members with heart, with passion, with, with desire. We're the ones that are there when our members lose our job. We're the ones when a healthcare worker gets cut out and asked to do two floors instead of one floor or five rooms instead of ten rooms. That is the kind of reputation and culture that we have in the union here today. So brothers and sisters, I welcome the debate, but we've all got to discuss what's in the interest of Canada, what's in the interest of our members, what's in the interest of Canadians. And just being the old, old isn't going to work because they're not playing by the old rules. They're playing by the sophisticated rules. They're playing by the rules to obviously destroy the labor movement. They're playing by the rules to privatize all public services, and allow the rich to get even richer. These are the rules that they're playing by. Employers today have more confidence today than they've ever had, whether it's public sector or private sectors, to take on the union. And I say to you, brothers and sisters, and I'm going to ask you to do this, in your lunch hour today or tomorrow morning, I want you to wake up, I want you to go to your room, I want you to look in the mirror, and I want you to ask yourself, where would this nation be without your voice? Where would this nation be without the progress that you make at the collective bargaining table? Where would this nation be? Where would your workplace be if your voice wasn't there? How many of you in this room take the job because in some cases nobody else wants it? But you stand up and you take charge because you know what's important to your members and you have the ability to defend the interest of your members. We don't always win, but through the union, through the power of collective power, we can at least make some progress. But because if we don't fight back as a union, if we don't use our collective strength, if we don't use our collective ideas and our collective thought process, brothers and sisters, the next convention is going to have 150 people. Then the convention after that is going to have 100. And then we're going to be down to 25 or 30. That's the reality. And if we're scared of the reality, then we, quite frankly, we can't face the challenges that our members need. So without any further ado, Rick, I want to thank you for allowing me to speak to the delegates here in Nova Scotia. I want to wish the leadership team the very best of luck moving forward. I want to say to the delegates that the people on the podium cannot win justice for our members in isolation. We are just human beings, trade union activists, just like you folks are on the floor. Someday, majority, some of you folks are going to be at the podium. You're going to be asked to lead. But at the end of the day, we cannot win without activism on the ground. We can't win without building the confidence of our members. We can't win unless we defend our union with vigor. When somebody's criticizing our union, regardless of what affiliated union it is, we stand up and say the union's important to the Canadian people. Unions is what makes a difference on whether you have a good standard of living or not a good standard of living. Unions make a difference on the social and economic fabric of this country, which we proved during the shipbuilding campaign. Brothers and sisters, your contribution to our union is unprecedented in any country in the world. But I got to ask you as a national leader of the CAW to give us 10% more. I know for many of you that's working at 110% 
What that goddamn guy's just like the boss. He wants me to go 120% now. What the hell's wrong with the guy? I got a god darn union too. But to the ones that are working at 75 and 80, and there's some of us out there. There's some of us up here. You got to get her up, man. You got to turn it up. Because you know what? Our members demand more. They expect more. And each and every day, as hard as we work, it's a damn privilege to represent our combined members. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Rick, sit down, sit down. Rick, Rick gave me 45 minutes, I think he said. If anybody wants to raise anything for five or six minutes, it's not part of the agenda. Sit down, Rick, relax. In fact, in fact Rick, go to the gym. Um, no, if anybody would like to raise anything, I'm not one of those guys who like to come in, give a speech, and run out and run. In fact, I'm going to run to the Occupy in the next hour or so before I fly out. But if anybody... If, if anybody, anybody wants to raise anything at all, anything at all, even a difference of opinion, that's what the labor movement's all about. Is there anybody want to give me shit? Anybody. Anybody want to vent? Anybody got a grievance? Holy God. I salute you for being so happy. Thank you very much. Excuse me, brother. Uh, Ella Carey, QB Local 5050. Cape Breton Victoria Regional School Board support staff. And I believe in what you said, 99.9% .9 of what you said. There was only that one little 0.1% was the remark that you made about not wanting to offend Catholics. <laughs> um, just in case you, you don't know, there's more people than Catholics in this room that believe in God. <laughs> I know, I know. And that's why we say, brother, we say we're good, but good spelt with two O's, not one. <laughs> Melissa Dory, CEP247. I just want to commend you for your passion, your enthusiasm, and I have to let everybody know what I witnessed yesterday. Yesterday after Occupy Nova Scotia was here and our brother from Local One had his speech as well, I went down to follow them downstairs yesterday. And this brother standing up here was down talking to them when I got down there. And he was telling them how inspired he was by them and that Whatever they need, water, blankets, anything that, his lo that the CAW nationally would donate that to them. And not only what did he do that, but after the fact, uh, our other brothers that were up here yesterday with CAW that uh, come in the front of the room in their jackets, when they were down there talking to him, he said, you need anything, anything at all, even jackets. He said, by the way, hey, give them your jackets. They took their jackets off their back and gave it to, to our young activists from Occupy Nova Scotia. So I want to thank you very much for your generosity. And, uh, you know, and I encourage every, every brother and sister in any little way, whether it's going down and joining Occupy Nova Scotia, donating anything, please do that. Thank you.
it or not, right or wrong, you tell me if I'm right or wrong, just a rule of thumb. In the last two weeks. I would if I could hear you. Right. The right. last two right. weeks. Last two weeks. Holy Christ, that's the first time I heard. The last, the last two weeks, through the occupies that started on Wall Street and passed throughout the world, the consciousness has grown better through the occupies than whatever the labor movement's done in the last 10 years. Every single day, we're talking about the social conscious of the country. So we got to go out. We don't take over those occupies. We just participate in it. We're just part of it. Because one thing about the Occupy folks, they don't want us to take over. Because in many ways, folks, let's be honest with each other. I know you're not going to like this. But some of them were even mad at the labor movement for the bureaucracy, for the structures, for the kind of uh, tolerance that we have with the, the, this power class of capitalists. So believe me, I went to Toronto and, and provided some support. And a couple of them ripped my ass for not being a lot tougher on, on capital, on power. And geez, I said, geez. Young man, do you read the newspaper? Do you watch news? Do you do anything? I, every day I'm kicking somebody from power in the ass. Not enough. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Go ahead, Mike, two last speaker, and I'll let Rick continue his business. And I, I'll let Rick continue his business. <laughs> Holy shit. What, what, what power? The only reason he's let me do this is because him and I exactly look alike. We got the same size body, and actually we're a mess. Go ahead. Hi, Ken. I'm uh, Dave Lattice from Local One. Um, the Ship Start Here campaign was obviously a great success for us here on the East Coast. But we have other shipyards here in Canada that employ major amounts of people. Now, in the States, they have the Jones Act, which protects the American waters that only American ships built and sailed by American sailors is allowed there. Now, here in Canada, you know, we got great waterways, right? Um, you know, the Wheat Board just went out Got two ships from Norway, thanks to uh, European trade, that free trade deal, which has really, you know, put other brothers and sisters out of work throughout this great country of ours, right? Um, we got to have something in place here in Canada to protect our workers. There's a lot more that can be done. I mean, ship start here is a wonderful thing, but we got to look all across Canada. We got to get all of our brothers and sisters working. Right and on. The Americans use shipbuilding as an economic booster, right? When you look and you read the, the articles about the Americans dumping billions and billions of dollars into their shipbuilding infrastructures, we can do the same here and get everybody working. Every skilled tradesperson that is required in a shipyard we got to build a stronger act here in Canada to make that happen. I agree. I agree totally. I... Okay, I'm going to sit down now, but get back up there, Mike, too. Get back up there. I don't want, that's not the story I want to hear. People know that trade, procurement, those issues are important. The shipbuilding example is an example for other sectors that we can use moving forward as a successful economic policy. So that's why it was important to Canada. What I want you to say as I walk off the mic is what you said to me last week. Mr. Lewenza, how do we keep our children in our province? Mr. Lewenza, my son had to leave this province to get a job. Mr. Lewenza, my family was broken up as a result of the lack of jobs in Canadians that not given the same opportunities as me. That's the story you should tell these delegates because it's not about you and me. It's about also keeping families together. So tell that story before you sit down or I'm giving you a spanking. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, my son had a job, a precarious job. Um, it was good money, but you know, when you're only you know, 20 hours a week or 15 hours a week, good money don't mean nothing, right? So, you know, what do you do? You pull up stakes and you move away. I mean, it's pretty fresh. It's only been a month since he's left. Um, you know what? I got one son in the shipyard, thank Christ, you know, and my other son, well, I'm trying to get him home. And, uh, this shift started here, you know, he's, he's on the Facebook to me, and he's, Jesus Christ, Dad, you got it, right? You know, when can I come home? And I'm like, well, you know what? It, it sounds good on paper, son, but, you know, a couple of years before we're up and rolling. <laughs> so, anyways, hopefully it brings him home. 